Ellen, you're here. We're a little bit early, uh, but if you're ready to go, we're ready for you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I have to say, I am so excited about what the governor said in his budget address for Working Lands Enterprise Fund. I mean, if we can hold it, that's gonna be awesome. I know, I know. Actually, I, I was in a conversation with Anson uh, Tebitz just before uh, the governor went on and he, you know, he was giving me a heads up that that was, you know, that was gonna happen. And, uh, and there's also a council for ag innovation or something that he didn't include in his budget speech, but that's part of the, the plan. And so, um, I, you know, it's really exciting. Yes. Um, Madam Chair, I think there's a couple of new members who don't know me. What would you like us to do? Oh, okay. Is this the first time you've been here? I can't even remember. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, what I would like to do then, Ellen, is we'll introduce ourselves to you, uh, featuring in particular the new folks, because you know most of us. <laughs> so I'll go around the little tiles here, starting with Tom. Hi, Alan. Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and North Springfield. All right, John. Hi, Alan. Uh, I guess we're going to see you tomorrow, too. Uh, I'm John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. Great. Vicki? Hi, Alan. Good to see you. Um, Representative Vicki Strong from Albany, and I represent seven towns in Orleans, Caledonia One. All right. Now one of our new members, Heather. Hi, Alan. I'm Heather Superna, and I represent Barnard, Pomfret, Queechee, and West Hartford. And I'm going to go to our next new member, and that's Henry Pearl. Henry, go ahead. Hey, Alan. Henry Pearl here. Uh, <laughs> And I represent Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. And I think we worked together a little bit on the VTC project there. So good to see you again. You too. Great. Rodney, go ahead. Rodney Graham, uh, represent Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Corinth, Mercier, and Chelsea. Thanks, Rodney. Terry? Uh, Terry Norris, I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. And you know me. Um, I represent Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. I know my committee members are so sick of hearing me say that. <laughs> all right, Ellen, tell us about what you've been up to. Sure. Um, so thank you, uh, Representative Partridge. And just so you all know, um, in case you don't yet have it on your calendars, but I hope hopefully you do. We will be uh, having a press conference that you'll all be invited to on February 8th to release the new Vermont Agriculture and Food System Strategic Plan 2021 to 2030, a new 10-year plan that came out of the Vermont Farm to Plate process, uh, doing that very collaboratively with the Agency of Agriculture and a whole host of subject matter experts in the field across the state. We're very excited to be um, releasing that. This is the one and only printed copy that currently exists on the planet. The rest are being printed as we speak. So you will be getting this mailed to you. So when it comes, guard it with your life. Yes, that's for sure. We're very excited to be done with it. It's, it was 18 months in the making. So uh, we'll be doing a press release, a press conference to release that on February 8th. And then on the 11th, we'll be in for three hours to talk with you and walk through it. So I wasn't originally planning to meet with all of you until then, but um, something has arisen that um, we wanted to uh, put in front of you for consideration uh, sooner than that. And uh, so what I'm gonna do is share my screen. Um, I, over the fall, was uh, talking with Representative Partridge about this uh, project that I've been involved with now for about seven years. Um, which is a regional effort with uh, the counter our counterparts uh, in the other six New England, other five New England states. So the work that we're doing with Vermont Farm to Plate, there are aspects of it that are that are happening in the other five New England states. And out of COVID and even before COVID hit, we were really thinking about how do we 
work together to really increase our overall regional food supply. And so this project idea of New England Feeding New England was born. And what I'm gonna do is just walk through a couple of, of slides here. And then there's some language that we're offering up to you all for consideration uh, to put into some legislative language related to emergency planning and preparedness. So I will, I will get there in a second. Uh, and Linda has put all of the documents up on your webpage so you can have a look. So um, what this, uh, I wanna start sort of the why we're, why we're, we're doing this. This is a, a map that shows the flow of food in the United States based on the, the, the US Agency of Transportation uh, has a data set called the uh, Commodity Flow Survey that they do every five years. And what this shows is literally the movement of food on rail, on, on roads, um, over bridges, um, uh, in the air, all the ways in which it travels. And what's interesting, what I wanted to focus on is really look, take a look at New England. Take a look at the concentration of the lines along the I-95 corridor. That's where the bulk of the food in and out of the region follows uh, this, these paths. So think about now the potential for climate-related events. Think about COVID-19 in terms of where, for instance, in the Midwest, you have so much concentration in the Midwest of, of uh, meat processing plants or California with its fires this summer uh, being in the Central Valley, so much food coming from there. It all flows, a lot of it flows east and it flows to us. But when you think about uh, climate events, you think about pandemics and you, then you think about what you saw there on the map with the, the um, I-95 corridor, um, we, we, we're like at the end of the road, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, we have lots of ends of roads here in Vermont, but we are in, as a region, the end of the United States when it comes to the movement of food. And so, um, and, then, and then layer on top of that, the fact that, that there has been this 30, 40 year uh, consolidation within the food system that has happened, that has concentrated uh, most of our production in the hands of a small, very small number of uh, agribusiness uh, multinational corporations. Um, and what that leads to is some real uh, vulnerabilities for our region. And if you, so if you take a look at the kind of food production that is, that takes place over uh, over New England, for instance, um, you can see here in that first column that, that New England across the six states produces 7.5 billion pounds of food. And you can take a look at the way that that's broken down, obviously mostly in dairy, um, but then also some amounts in vegetables and, um, and other related products. If you take a look at uh, in Vermont, in the last column, you can see out of our, uh, Vermont produces 2.9 billion pounds of food, 2.7 billion pounds of which is dairy. And then you can see what happens other, in other ways. Maine has, uh, it, the bulk of its production is in vegetables and in vegetables, it's primarily potatoes. So another way to look at this is like this pie chart here, which shows that uh, the total pounds across New England, these different pie charts, the first one on the left, in terms of how each of the states, how much food is produced in each of the six New England states, and then of that food, what is the percentage of different products? And that's that uh, pie chart on the right. Another way to look at it, uh, the same data is like this. So the question becomes, from a food vulnerability perspective or, or a food security perspective, I should say, the ability to feed ourselves or at least a growing uh, share of what we eat from within New England, we have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of being able to um, strengthen uh, a whole range of product categories with greater production. As, as, as uh, Representative Pearl knows, and many of you, we. Vermont is the is the is the the milk jug of the entire uh, region. We, we ship Vermont milk all over the region, and Vermont's milk supply basically is almost enough to 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 feed the region uh, from dairy products perspective. But you can't survive on dairy alone, and so there's a lot of additional products that Vermonters 
eat on a regular basis that we could actually be producing in greater quantities here. So another way to think about this, uh, and this comes from that, that food flows data that I showed you with a map at the start, New England produces 7.5 billion pounds. We export 66, uh, set, we, 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 we export 66 billion pounds. We import 71 billion pounds. So what that means is that there's all this food that's flowing in and out of region. So for instance, whether that's Vermont's dairy, whether that's Maine's lobsters and other seafood, for instance, they, they, they harvest all of the seafood and then they uh, ship it out to, across the country. And then they import a whole bunch of other types of seafood back into the region. So this is one of the fundamental things we're questioning is, if we're, we're producing 7.5 billion pounds, but we're importing 71 billion pounds, how might we rethink about our regional food system in a way that tries to get both circles a little bit more in balance? We're not saying here Vermont or New England can be an island. We, we can't, we can't, we, we can't produce oranges. We like our chocolate, we like our coffee. So we're not saying that at all. What we're saying is, what would it look like if we actually increased the amount of food that was flowing with, that was produced in the six state region that flowed within the six state region instead of just being exported and then also imported. Um, and that export number, I should say, the reason I got tripped up, I was trying to remember, um, a, a lot of that is because there's, there's food that comes in from Europe and from Canada that flows through us to other places. Okay, that explains it, Ellen. That was that was confusing to me. If we're only pr producing seven point five billion, how can we be exporting sixty six? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that it, it, this is again. This is the food hmm. flows. So it's like, yep. where does it land, and then where does it move to? Great. So the six states have a, a form of farm to plate, and then we're collaborating with a regional group called Food Solutions New England. And we basically designed this project called New England Feeding New England. And the three main thrusts are, what would it look like to create some milestones in each of the six states that in total, we might be able to get to 35% uh, regional food consumption at 35% by 2035. So right now in Vermont, we know that we're somewhere north of 15% of all food dollars is spent on Vermont grown, raised, produced food. Well, what would happen? What would it look like? What would we need to do to get to 35% across the whole region with all six states contributing to that? And again, some of the states, obviously, like Vermont and Maine, are going to contribute more on the production side. And the consumption side is going to happen more on the southern New England states because that's where the population is. We want to, of course, do this with climate-friendly production practices because one of the one of the uh, challenges that we're going to be continuing to face is climate events. We don't, if we're going to increase production, we don't want to be uh, uh, increasing the greenhouse gas emissions and and uh, and things that then contribute to even more climate change. So that's another piece of the puzzle. And then, thirdly, the third third circle, and this is what I really want to talk to you about, and what the legislation could include, is around more emergency preparedness, emergency management planning for food security. And I wanna just define what we're talking about in terms of food security, because the official definition of food insecurity is when a household, for instance, or a person does not have enough food available to eat or does not have the resources needed to acquire food in order to have the level of caloric intake that they need. Right? So there's a food insecurity, basically hunger. Food security, so, so we want to be contributing to solving the hunger crisis in our, in our region, in our state. But at the same time, we're using this language of food security to address issues of supply chain vulnerabilities, of trying to get so that more of our production is happening within the region and staying within the region to shorten those supply chains, to strengthen supply chains so that we can be a little bit more uh, balanced in that food flows in and out uh, of the region. 
So uh, the goal of this project, expand and fortify the region's food supply and distribution system to ensure the availability of adequate, affordable, socially and culturally appropriate products under a variety of rapidly changing climate, environmental and public health conditions. So this project is currently being funded by uh, this, it's very early stage, we're in a planning uh, phase, but we've gotten some funding from the John Merck Fund and from a, a grant from the USDA World, uh, from USDA. Um, and so, as I uh, mentioned, th there's three objectives here, which is um, to really look at what's, and this direct, this one directly relates to you all and what we're talking about today. What are the policy conversations and best practices for conducting emergency feeding operations in each state, as well as responses to COVID-19 induced supply chain disruptions? And then how do we connect these practices to existing climate action, resiliency, emergency preparedness plans in each of the states and the region and codify those approaches for the future so that when there's another pandemic or when there's another climate event, we're more prepared than what we started uh, COVID-19 with of having plans in place to mobilize really quickly from an emergency perspective, but then how do we also just ensure that we don't have so many emergencies because we're planning to increase production. So we're, again, meeting more of our food needs from within the region. So, the, and that speaks to this component of it, which is, as I mentioned, getting to 35% uh, by 2035. Uh, and part of that will include setting some milestones state by state for what is going to be needed for production purposes. And then obviously you increase production, you got to have the infrastructure for that, whether that's food processing facilities, whether that's meat processing facilities, storage, distribution routes, more distribution companies, and the financing to support all that. So it's not just like, oh, let's just, you know, put on another million acres worth of, of uh, diversified vegetable and livestock and we're good to go. There's all of the things that come along with that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the third part of, of this work is around greenhouse gas emissions and making sure that we're not contributing to the problem uh, of climate change as we're addressing it. So here's the opportunity uh, is to contemplate uh, putting together some legislative language in whatever bill you feel is the right one, but the essence of it would be to instruct the Agency of Agriculture to expand what's included already in the Vermont Emergency Management Plan, the, the Agency of Agriculture. And specifically to call for supporting agricultural and processed food production expansion in the state in order to mitigate the impacts of food supply chain disruptions in the future and to create plans which will include instructions for making food products available to residents, as well as instructions for increasing food production within the state. So this gets at the just overall growing the sector and then develop in collaboration to do that work in collaboration with all the other appropriate uh, state agencies and departments, as well as the nonprofit community, specifically the, the emergency feeding uh, organizations, the charitable food uh, organizations. And then, um, and note that it may mean that there's other parts of the state's emergency uh, management plan that also need to get tweaked in order to have everything really all in alignment. And then secondarily <laughs> to instruct the agency of ag uh, to work with partners to collect information about all the emergency feeding operations that were coordinated and in essence stood up like the Vermont Everyone Eats program during COVID-19 uh, and capture those lessons learned and best practices so that we're even more prepared for emergency events in the future. So in essence, it's taking what has, has arisen because of COVID-19, capturing the lessons learned, developing plans so that we're ready for the next time when it happens, and then really making a, a concerted effort to create plans and then follow with investment dollars to strengthen Vermont's food system uh, in service to an even broader uh, regional food system. So we're feeding more Vermonters with Vermont food and we're also feeding more New Englanders with Vermont food. And the exciting thing here, uh, as Rep Representative Partridge knows, is that what we're, my counterparts in the other five states are also trying to get language just like this uh, adopted by their legislatures 
um, and getting their emergency uh, management uh, entities to do the same mm -hmm. thing so that we would actually have something very similar from an architecture standpoint in place in, in all six states. So um, we would love for Vermont to, to do this and, and work with you on, on doing this. Um, I can say that um, uh, I talked, I spoke with already with um, the folks at the agency, uh, with Abby and, and Deputy Secretary Eastman and Secretary Tevitz and um, Diane Bothfeld, and um, they're all uh, in agreement that this is doable. Like they don't see this as like anything that they wouldn't be supportive mm -hmm. of. Um, it would be, this is just par normally part of what they do anyways. Whenever there's an emergency, they update their emergency management plans. It's part of what we do it, that gets done as a state when there are emergencies, those plans get updated. And so if you, what I, um, on the, on your webpage, I, I included the last annex, uh, which was passed last February. It was updated last February. Um, and you will notice in there that it really reflects sort of water quality, high water type events, you know, like think tropical storm Irene, you know, it's really about like what happens when a whole bunch of, of, of fields that have vegetables and it flood with water that's, that may not be suitable, you know, that might be safe for then human consumption. Like, what do you do with that? Or there's an avian flu outbreak. What do you do with that? So, and these emergency management plans really sort of provide a, a, um, a checklist of action steps that agency personnel then are mobilized and, and do. And so what we're saying is, let's take a look at, could we add to that plan a component around this notion of food security and planning for greater food resilience and shortening of supply chains uh, and strengthening our overall ag production? Um, so that's the essence of what the ask is. There's some language. There's a, on your webpage, there's a, um, uh, a, a one pager that uh, I put together for your consideration and it includes the language that's like direct, this quote is directly from the current annex so that it, you, you can see how it fits, how the, the, the agency annex fits within the, the larger emergency ma management plan. And then some, some language just conceptually um, and then indicating that we wanna capture uh, what what has happened um, amazingly since uh, COVID-19 started, and then um, some links to those plans and such. So that's all there um, for your consideration. I'm happy to take questions about the concept. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, like, is this a standalone bill? Does this go into your general omnibus ag bill that you do every year? Like, all of that is obviously your call, but I just wanted to offer this up and, and ask that uh, maybe this gets included in, in your work. Well, Alan, thanks so much. This is really uh, exciting and helpful to see this on paper. And uh, I know that over the last couple of years, we've asked the Agency of Agriculture to do a heck of a lot and including you. Uh, and we're gonna be hearing more about this in February. Uh, one of your big projects, but also the uh, grant making and what have you. And I'm glad to hear that the ag folks think that they could do this. Um, my inclination, uh, because we are all, well, those of us who have been around a while know what happens to the housekeeping bill and how it's fraught with intrigue and, um, and excitement, especially around the end of the year. And, um, uh, you know, I'll we'll we'll have a discussion as a committee, but it seems to me that probably it makes sense for us to do this as a separate bill and potentially get it through the process a little bit faster. Uh, I for for new folks, do you want to just describe very briefly uh, what an annex is? Maybe even for some of us older folks too. But what what is an annex? Um, that's a good question. I'm not an expert on this by any stretch. All of this is new lingo, right? It's a whole other um, uh, vocabulary. But I, I think of it as sort of like an addendum or part of an appendix. Each agency has their own set of plans for the things that they are primarily jurisdictionally responsible for, right? So in like the Department of Health has their whole 
a bunch of, of, of things that they have to do. So this is in essence what the Agency of Agriculture uh, it has jurisdictional sort of leadership with, so to speak, within mm. this larger state emergency management plan. And I would really highly recommend that you reach out to Diane Bothfeld because my understanding is she's the person on point at the agency that could really describe this way better than I can. Um, and and so uh, it it lists in there, for instance, the other agencies and departments that they collaborate with. But the exciting thing about these annexes, from my one of them, one of the many exciting things, is that um, you may know that when that uh, state agency personnel they do exercises, so like tabletop exercises, like what happens if there is another big tropical storm, like tropical storm Irene that comes in, they like will t do a two day exercise to like practice how this, how they would, what they would do, the chain of command, the information flows, all of those kinds of things. What would it look like if there was a state of emergency and they got mobilized? That, that's the kind of, this, working on something like this around food security would elevate the whole concept of, of preparing for increased food production in the state to a level we we've never gone to before, you know, it's it would be it's as if these worlds were completely separate. And what we're saying is like, no, there's actually some connection points here that we want to plan for. Thanks, Ellen. I'm wondering if we have some questions from the committee for Ellen. Vicky, Ellen, we can't help but be excited because you're excited, and. Um, to see how thick that is, I, I know the amount of work, I don't know the amount of work really, um, but when you were talking and I did think back as we all think back to those early COVID weeks and toilet paper suddenly became a shortage. I mean, you must have had all these things in mind, potential shortages. And when you showed that map of all those lines, I mean, I wouldn't know where toilet paper comes from, but in the bigger picture, when you're mentioning <laughs> Food system, our food systems, it can include paper products. And uh, we've been talking about shortages for animals with hay and grain. So as you're thinking about the bigger picture, I'm sure those things are coming into play. Could you just elaborate a little bit on how we even know sometimes what would be a shortage? We don't sometimes. So how, do you, how does that play into everything? Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question, you know, and, and, um, you know, one of, I think the, the most relevant example is really around uh, when COVID-19 uh, outbreaks happened in the meat processing plants out in the Midwest, uh, before um, the pres pre President Trump's uh, order that they all go and, and work no matter what, even if they were ill, um, you know, there were a couple of weeks there where a lot of animals had to get slaughtered because there was no way that they were actually going to ever make it to market because there was not enough processing capacity uh, across the country, but in the Midwest in particular, in the meat big, the really big meat packing houses. And so, you know, like many of us had this understanding in our head, but we've never lived through it before. We've never actually seen it really truly happen. And I remember hearing from uh, Secretary Tebbets that he was getting contacted by legislators in Massachusetts saying, hey, can Vermont ship more Vermont beef to Massachusetts? Because we, you know, our shelves are, are, are empty. And so like all, it, it just, I think what we're at a moment in time where there's an opening to have this conversation that didn't exist before. And we've seen firsthand what this means. And you're absolutely right there's some of this stuff we can't totally predict what's gonna happen, but if we could increase, our, our proposition is if we could increase the amount of regionally produced food that is circulating within the region, we would be less prone to these shocks that happen in the system when nationally something big happens. You know, like think about all the vegetables that come from the Central Valley in California and think about the fires that happened this summer. Like, you know, how do we how do we mitigate? How do we plan for and reduce the risks? It doesn't solve the problems, but it reduces the risk. Does that answer your question? Great, thanks, Vicky. Great question, uh, John. Go ahead, <clears throat> Ellen. This whole conversation uh, makes me think of beer. <laughs> in that, 
you know, I know for Farm to Plate, that's been uh, an important contributor uh, as, as far as consuming local agricultural products. Um, and it, and it, I think that would be an interesting model to study as far as, you know, in the last 20 years, how sort of intensely local beer has become. So if you look at New England, it'd be interesting to know what percentage now New England drinks of New England beer um, and, and not you know, just being neutral on whether it's even a good thing, but uh, it's, it's interesting as far as it's made in New England, a lot of it, a lot more of it. If you look at the shelves in the Hannaford's or Shaw's, it's, it's amazing how much, you know, it's New England based now. And, and also just that, that, you know, it, the, all those blue lines are, are incredibly shortened by, by something like this. And we're, and I would say most New Englanders are paying more for local, local beer which if we could if we could clone that with all the you know the various foods you have in mind uh that would be a great model yeah great point and and you know part of this is um you know to go without saying really it's all of them the, the economic impacts that this would have right because it's most food production happens in our rural communities in our in our rural economy and that, and the more that those dollars are circulated within the Vermont economy or within the regional economy, the more that that continues to build uh, the economic base uh, of our region. And um, you know, obviously, there's an awful lot of Vermonters that can't afford uh, a four pack of Hetty Topper, <laughs> but uh, and and so we have to address that as well. But um, again, if we're increasing production and, and uh, able to increase the profitability of Vermont food, and regional food, then that, that should uh, inform uh, wages that, that food workers and farmers and, and such are, are able to um, get from the process. So um, I know it's a little bit more challenging uh, in, the, in the milk industry, uh, Representative Porrell, because the, you don't control the price, prices that are um, paid for the milk that is produced, um, but I think I think there's some there's just a greater opportunity to strengthen the overall rural economy the more that we're able to have greater control over our own uh, food production. Are there any other questions for Ellen? Comments? Uh, Vicki, you go ahead and uh, I'm just going to duck. I got to let the dogs out. So I'll be right back. Go ahead. Just a, thank you. Just a kind of thought, Ellen, when it, when it comes to this whole big picture you're dealing with, how much of it would be consumer education um, in terms of even as Vermonters, I don't anticipate these things. So I shop a week at a time, a lot of times, and really is as a person who should be more thoughtful about thinking forward, I should have more than a week's worth of groceries in the house. Um, and there's just so many things when it comes to how we consume products, um, as well as how we buy them and have them you know, available. I'm just thinking about the bigger picture of education to all of us um, about food availability and how we shop or local places to have it even, um, with our emergency uh, suppliers, uh, a Red Cross, you know, all these different aspects that work together. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And you're absolutely right. Uh, there needs to be more work done to educate consumers about um, the opportunity of buying more local, what that can look like in all the different ways. Um, you may recall, we've been in talking about our Rooted in Vermont uh, consumer campaign, which is really about celebrating all the different ways that Vermonters consume local, whether that's through foraging or hunting or fishing or backyard gardening. There's there's all a whole range. You know, it's not just about going to the grocery store, um, but you're absolutely right. Like having some greater awareness about how to um, how to shop, how to prepare uh, food. Although I will say, boy, there's been again, a huge opportunity that has been capitalized during COVID. I mean, more of us are cooking at home, um, thinking about these things, practicing our improving our, our cooking skills um, uh, because of out of necessity, right? And, uh, um, and I think what we've also seen is a lot of consumers uh, during the pandemic have really turned to their local 
producers, farmers down the road, increases in sales at farm stands, for instance, and bundling of multi-farms uh, coming together to bundle their products uh, into, into box packages uh, because people are wanting uh, a greater variety than what one farm can produce. All of those things that, are, that we've seen happen over the last 10 months, um, uh, I think has, has come out of the fact that out of necessity, uh, and people not feeling, in this particular case, not feeling as safe to go to a grocery store. So they feel safer knowing exactly where their food comes from. You know, they read the articles about the meat processing plants and there was, and because of all the attention paid to it, mm -hmm. there were a lot mm -hmm. more photographs taken of what the inside of a meat processing plant in the Midwest looks like, the really big ones. And I, I you know, I think that must have informed some people's uh, like local meat has has gone through the roof in terms of people buying. So um, all of that is is part of this mix of the kind of conversations that we need to be happening alongside the actual production side of things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Heather. Go ahead. I think this is such a systemic and intersectional issue when you're talking about it, and I think that when you're talking about how there was such an increase in folks wanting to purchase from local producers, that is absolutely true. As a small vegetable farmer myself, we noticed those increases, but I think you're so right to note who was able to purchase that. And I'm just also knowing that one in three Vermonters was food insecure during the pandemic. And I'm wondering how we can continue to balance that conversation and recognition of farmers who need to be paid a livable wage, but equally noticing that those who are in rural communities are disproportionately marginalized when it comes to access to nutrient-dense food. And I think that economic portion is such a hard part to acknowledge when we are talking about food security. And I know it's a conversation that'll need to be continued, but if you had any thoughts on that. You are, you really raise it's such an important point. Thank you for, for doing that. And that's part of what, uh, you know, was so unbelievable from an outcomes perspective with Vermont Everyone Eats. I mean, here you have this, you know, perfect program of all these Vermonters, more Vermonters needing food. And you had restaurants who needed to be keeping their employees uh, employed. And you had farmers who were, had lost their institutional and, uh, and restaurant sales coming together around in their communities to basically produce these amazing meals that got distributed to way more people than normally would have access, say, the, their, their food shelf or, or food from the, that came from the Vermont Food Bank. So I don't, and I have been part of that, the statewide task force that's been part of that program. So um, I don't think that it's necessarily a long-term solution uh, you know, we were just talking yesterday on the on our on our weekly call about the fact that we've got funding in place now to get through the end of June with the program, which is terrific as long as the the emergency um, uh, declaration is is still in place. But we all recognize that's not a sustainable model. Um, but there's there's lessons to be learned there. There's aspects that we were playing around, like well, well, how could you keep this piece going? You know, which was really about that com community connection. You know, you have all these like little uh, food pantries that are popping up in, in, outside of churches, for instance, for people to just, you know, no stigma attached. You just, if you need something, just go pick it up, you know, and people dropping stuff off to, be, to, 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 to leave in these, these little pantries. Again, that doesn't get at the systemic issues that you're raising, but in terms of meeting emergency needs of helping people who are hungry to get the food that they need now, um, I think we've... Um, there's just a really a much greater awareness uh, about what it really takes to do that. Uh, we are hearing from evaluations that are being done uh, for Vermont Everyone Eats about um, how restaurants uh, had didn't have any idea about the whole emergency feeding program and how now they're so much more aware of that and um, want to continue in some way to support their community members that that need help. Um, but you know the bottom line is we have systemically, we, Vermonters and, 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 and workers across this country have had stagnant wages for 20, 30 years. And so, and as a result, can't afford the food and what it actually costs to produce. And as you say, 
farmers oftentimes themselves are food insecure or have really, really struggle uh, because of what they're paid for, for what they produce and, and the cost of production in this region. So not saying anything you don't already know, it's just simply to say it is complex. There is lots of moving parts and pieces and in the plan that's coming to you, um, we've tried to address all of that. So there's a chapter on labor and workforce. There's a chapter on uh, consumer education and consumer, uh, K through 12, uh, as well as, as adult uh, consumer education. There's a, a chapter on food security. There's, a ch there's all sorts of product, product related uh, briefs uh, there. There's, um, uh, we're getting it. We actually brought in, for instance, the impact of the lack of affordable childcare for farm families is a huge barrier for a, a huge challenge or the lack of, of adequate uh, rural transportation or uh, other alternative means of transportation for food workers like restaurants, for instance. You know, you, you have a, uh, someone that works at a, at a restaurant and they don't have a car uh, and they, their shift ends at midnight. There's no way for them to catch a bus to get home. You know, like there's all of these pieces of the puzzle that uh, are just inadequately addressed at this point that are real problems and sticking points. So we have to take a, a, a systemic systems level uh, approach to solving these problems because it's not like you know one or two things are gonna are gonna take care of it. So um, so yes, we have to find a way to balance the the sort of hunger, emergency feeding, charitable food system needs, and the fact that we need to be paying people more, including farmers, for what is produced, so that. Um, everybody is benefiting from this increased demand and interest in, in local local food. So yes, <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Uh, other questions or comments for Ellen? And this is of course also why we need to have the Vermont Tech's Ag and Food Program. Yes. Re-energized and re revisioned as uh, Representative Pearl has weighed in on a lot on the uh, dairy subgroup uh, conversations about what does the dairy component need to still look like uh, at Vermont Tech. You know, th that's the place in Vermont uh, and we'd like to say the region for the next generation of farmers and food entrepreneurs to get trained up uh, and launch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John has his hand up. John, go ahead. Oh, just quickly, I, sort of a chicken or egg question, Ellen. I mean, when I think of New England feeding New England, it's such a good idea, you know, economically and culturally. And then I think, is the emergency part of this um, all about, sorry about my dog. Is, you that, know, uh, is, is that the glue that's gonna get six New England states actually to work together because it's it's happened? I mean, that's, that's one of our, our, our thoughts, you know, it's like, we've all known that we need to go in this direction. Um, I recall, for instance, when we released the first farm to plate plan back in 2011, um, then secretary of ag, uh, Chuck Ross was talking about like, well, all this stuff about local, we need to be able to get into regional markets. And at the time, most of our producers, other than the dairy industry, and a few larger vegetable growers really didn't have the ability to get into the regional markets at the, at, you know, to really ramp up and increase because mm. of volume, because of packaging, because of distribution challenges, a, a whole number of reasons. And so, but what's shifted over the last 10 years is there's a greater um, readiness of Vermont producers to enter the regional market. There's a greater knowledge of how to do it. We have more infrastructure in place in, in terms of additional dis distributors that are selling into the region. Um, there's just, you know, like we're more ready now. And so like we've been progressing to this point, I think. And, uh, and as you say, it's like, so then it, it's like, well, what, what, what's, what's stopping it, right? And there's a whole reasons of what's, you know, or what could, I could, let me rephrase it. What could accelerate the rate? And one of our ideas was, well, what if we come at this from this emergency management perspective, because that's what's on top of mind for everybody right now. And that's a whole community of people that we've never engaged with. Could that be some of the impetus to actually accelerate 
uh, the, the, the production, uh, which includes bringing money, many, 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 many more hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres into production. Like, it's not like this is going to happen overnight and it's going to like, woohoo, we've got all the farmers ready to go. Like that doesn't, that's not there yet. Right. But how do we start planning for this um, going forward? And that's why we set a, a 15 year time horizon because we're like, like even that's going to be a stretch. If Vermont's at, you know, 15, 16, 17% local consumption, we'll know, we'll know by June what that number is because we're just starting to collect that data now. Um, we know that, you know, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, they're probably at 5% you know, maybe 10% across the whole region. We don't actually know, but probably that, that that's more of the ballpark that we're talking about. So to get to 35% would be huge. Could we get to, but, and so that's why we want to break this down by different product categories, because we may have enough or almost enough dairy, but what about livestock? What about vegetables? What about fruit like apples? What about, you know, sweet corn? What about processed foods, you know, all those kinds of things. We need to really try to get our head around, like, what are we really talking about in terms of what's going to be needed? Because, you know, as just as a, for instance, we had a focus group with um, a bunch of beef producers as part of the, the new plan development this fall. And they're at something like 17 million in sales. And we said to them, okay, well, think out 10 years given what you know about the trajectory of consumer demand, what you're selling, what you're seeing in the marketplace, where do you think you could get to in 10 years? And they said, well, we could probably almost double. We could probably get to, you know, 26, 27, 28 million dollars worth of sales. And then they said immediately, but we don't have enough processing capacity right now to handle that. So this is where like, okay, you can increase production, but then you need the processing, you need the storage, you need the distribution, you need the outlets to be able to get into. Um, and that's why we have to take this, this total systemic approach to this. Then Ellen, I think I'm, I'm hopeful that some of that working lands, $3 million is, you know, is dedicated to the processing end of um, our slaughter. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments for Ellen? Ellen, thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we're going to see you again tomorrow, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, working lands. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'll have my but, other hat on tomorrow. Uh, yes, exactly. Exactly. Thanks so much. This is so exciting for me. Um, I think I know what I'm going to write my weekly article on this week. So. Excellent. And so let me know then how I can be helpful as you start to think about language and all of that. Uh, mm. for, uh, if you want to go that route, what that might look like, let me know how I can be helpful. Yeah, hopefully, uh, well, well, we'll be contacting our Ledge Council. Hopefully, uh, Michael Grady will be back soon. Uh, we miss him so much, but uh, we'll, maybe we'll forward this to Kelly, his, uh, Kelly McGill, who is his his replace, not a replacement, but his, you know, right hand woman. Um, Rodney has his hand up. Rodney, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to, after listening to all this, I just want to let Alan know I'm on board. I'm switching from a dairy uh, farm to beef production. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. I know that was a big, difficult decision for you to make last year. I remember you going through that, but. Uh, you know, and that's not to say that beef production is uh, is easy, but um, I think there's definitely an increased uh, opportunity there. So good for you for, for moving in that direction. And you don't have to get up at 2.30 in the morning to milk. Exactly, exactly. Oh, and there's that, a lot, but you know, there's a lot of great technical and business assistance to help uh, folks that want to make that, that shift, so. I'm, st I'm still contemplating whether to, uh, convert my milking center into a slaughterhouse, but oh, oh interesting. <laughs> you know, I, I'm ha I'm ha I had had almost all my milking equipment sold, and then the pandem pandemic hit, and everybody backed out. Mm. <laughs> so I that said, is a bummer. 
yeah. Oh, maybe this year. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Cutting some but, inquiries. We'll, need, so. we'll probably be needing more dairy too eventually if this all gets, you know, um, we all pull this all out by 30, 2035. Gosh, I hope I'll be around still. <laughs> Will you be having uh, the folks from Vermont Everyone Eats in, or have they already been in? Um, you know, I I don't, we haven't had them in, but that would be, a, that's a great idea. So yeah. maybe you can send some some of the names to uh, Linda. Happy to. Great, Ellen, thanks There's so much. A, it's a very good news story. And, uh, you know, we had put in the legislation to have 10% local sourcing and it's, I don't know what the final number is, but it's it's at least 15%, if not getting close to 20, which is really excellent. Yeah, you know, I always feel weird about receiving meals made by other people because we have some, I have freezers full of food that we put there. But um, I have to say after my knee replacement, uh, some of my neighbors started bringing me everyone eats meals and, and it was just delightful. On, it, they were delivered on Wednesdays and I didn't have to cook. It was great. And they were, they were good, you know? I knew those carrots and summer squash and what have you came, came from around here, no doubt, so. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, a lot of folks who were recently unemployed that you know normally are not getting SNAP benefits and and uh, and also just like the stigma of uh, still that's out there of of getting charitable food who because it was like no just just come and get it um, yeah it really helped a lot of people who really needed it to be able to get food on the table that otherwise really would have gone even more hungry. Yeah. And, you know, um, I was convinced because they said, you know, I felt bad. I said, give it to people who really need it. And, and they said, but no, the restaurants, you know, are struggling. They get $10 a meal for producing these. And so I said, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ellen, so much. We really appreciate your time always. Oh, and no I'm always, ex always excited and inspired when you come. So thank you. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your afternoon, everybody. It's a good day.